देव की यू वॉन्ट दिस टू टेल समी यस भगवान प्लीज आई हैव नथिंग टू से This episode of the Palak Mehta show is very special to me. Today we celebrate the life and teachings of a great saint, Yogi Ram Surat Kumar. He left his body in 2001 and had spent most of his post enlightenment period in Tiruvannamalai. Today we are blessed to have his closest disciple, Ma Devki with us. She will share beautiful stories of his life and I hope you really enjoy this episode. he was wearing very colorful two or three shawls and a very carelessly tied turban over his head and his eyes were shining my god he was extraordinary what do you want from this beggar what do you want I want to see God. What? You want to see God? And I said, so terrible. I wanted the earth to open and swallow me. And then, you know, his face softened. And then he said, there he is. This beggar has not seen God. How can he help you? This beggar has not seen God. But oh, when you want to see God, and then he said, "Oh, Devki is a good soul. She will see God." Yogi Ram Surat Kumar. He was born in a small village, Nadra near Kashi, and uh, just like Raman Mari, she was born in Tiruchuri near Madurai, and uh, he he was a uh, He was a very different boy, even even from childhood. He was very different from the other boys. Of course, one thing he loved was s- swimming in the Ganges. There's a beautiful Ganges there. It's right on the bank of the Ganges. And uh, you see, when other boys would go to assist their fathers in the fields, and they would be grazing the cattle, this fellow would come and sit there and gaze at the Ganges. for hours he kept himself aloof from the other people and mostly he was given given to contemplation there was one kapadiya baba he was his earliest mentor when kapadiya baba appeared in the village the children would be frightened and you know they would run away from the place but this little boy ram surat kumar would go in search of him sit near him prostrate before him and then ask for upadesh so kapadiya baba loved him so much he began to shape this little boy towards his future of course kapadiya baba was a realized soul he knew the future of ram surat kumar from 4 years can you believe that from 4 years this boy would spend time with those sadhus and what was more he could not see any saw the boy hungry and this boy would run to his house his mother would have piled up lots of chapatis and then he would just see look here and there the mother was not around he would take the whole lot and run out to the sadhus and distribute so he had such a great traits in him 
He was also very quiet, a man, a boy of very few words. And once uh, Kapadia Baba asked him to go, and he was about, no, at the age of 13, something happened, a turning point in his life, Ram Surat's life. He used to help his mother with a household call. And one day, his mother asked him to fetch some water from the well. So this boy, it was dusk, you know, evening twilight. This boy took a bucket and uh, uh, what do you call that, the rope. So he went there and uh, on one of those uh, dikes of the well, there was a bird sitting, perched on that. When this boy saw that at a distance, he shouted, shoo, and then threw the rope just to shoo it away, unintentionally. But it hit the bird somewhere that it fell dead immediately. Now this was a great, great shock to this boy. This boy did not know the bird passed away. He very desperately took the bird in his hands. He cried and then he went to the river, took some water and poured it into its mouth and prayed and prayed and prayed, but to, but in vain. Then he found that the bird was gone completely and then he left it in the Ganges. The whole night the boy was crying, crying, crying his heart out, thinking, why would this happen? I never meant this to happen. I just playfully, my playful innocence, I threw the rope just to shoo it away. I never meant to kill it, but still this happened. Who made it happen? Because I did not intend it. It happened by itself. Then who is directing our life? Who is running our life? What is life? What is death? What was in the bird before that left the bird later? The serious issues of life began to plague him. This playful boy of 13 years was whipped into a new type of consciousness. You see, you understand, it must have been a, too sudden for him. The whole night he did not go home, he just spent it on the banks of the river crying and thinking and thinking and thinking. After that, his spiritual search, you know, it, it deepened. He used to seek solitude and then of course Kapadiya Baba came and then he instructed him to go to Kashi have the Rishna Krishna. So at the age of 16, this little boy, he went to Kashi alone and when he entered the sanctum sanctum of Kashi Vishwanath, suddenly he found the whole place filled with golden light. Yogiji, as a boy of 16, he saw it in the Vishwanathji Mandar and he almost fainted because the energy was too much. And then, of course, he managed, he came to um, the guard, you know, what do they call it? Manikarnika guard, where the dead bodies were being burnt. He came there and he sat for quite a few hours and again he went into a higher state. It was happening very naturally to him. He did not even know that he was meditating. And then, you know, he was very fond of Lord Buddha. He was very, very fond of him. He knew that uh, the Saranath was only 13 kilometers away. So he walked all the way, 16-year-old boy. He walked all the way and he went to this uh, stupi there. That's a stupi where Lord Buddha gave, after his enlightenment, the first place he came to with his disciples, the five disciples, was the Saranath. And this, where the stupi is now, that was the place where he sat and gave his first sermon, the first teachings, came out of Shri Buddha's mouth only in that space. It was a huge stupi. So when this boy approached the stupi, again he went into a higher state. He went into a trance. What does it mean? 
it was inherent in him, these higher states already. He simply had to go into serious meditation and touch those levels and then uh, they would develop to perfection. That's a pivotal event that triggered, that made him, made him even more serious about spiritual life. Right? And after that he, he completed, he even got married because no, in the north they would insist at the age of 20, 20 years, oh the boy is 20 years old and he's not married and people would start gossiping. So, so in those days, uh, he tried to escape, he ran away. The first time the bride was seen, he ran away from the place. And then the bride had to be married to his brother. Now the second time, they knew now, they were very ready, they were very tricky, you know, in that they arranged something where he could not escape at all. And uh, he had to see the girl. And as soon as he saw the girl, just as Ramakrishna saw, Shatha Devi and said, yes, like uh, Yogi Ram Sarikma, Ram Sarikma saw this girl, Ram Ranjini Devi, and he said, yes. So they were married. He was leading a married life with children. He was also working in schools as a headmaster sometimes and as teacher. While teaching also, he would go to a Shiva temple nearby and sit for meditation. And he was also following the instructions of Kapadiya Baba. And one day the call became irresistible. You know, something very interesting happened. He was returning from Kapadiya Baba's ashram. Suddenly he heard a voice, you know, something like an oracle. It said, what you are now doing is not your work. This is Vivekananda calling you. What you are doing now is not your work. Then he just looked around. He wanted to know who spoke, but there was nobody there. So he ignored and walked away. And after some time, again, when he was returning from school, he heard the same oracle. The voice said, this is Vivekananda calling you. What you are now doing is not your work. And this time, he something happened to him after hearing this. There was a fire, you know, in his body and he could no more rest. He had to go in search of his Guru. Because Kapriya Baba said, I am not your Guru. Your Guru is the South. He said there are spiritual giants. He spoke about Raman Maharishi and Sri Aurobindo. And that is how he took long leave from school and started on his search of the journey of search of Guru. When he was traveling, you know, he was still a teacher, so he bought the ticket. He had some money left and he was wearing a kurta and uh, he had all this in his possession. When he boarded the train, there was such a crowd, people were jostling each other to get inside and he joined the crowd because he was right in the middle and then people came up more and more and they were crushing him into the train. So after boarding the train, when the ticket collector came, he put his hand into his pocket only to see the hand coming out of the other way. It was clean cut. Somebody had pickpocketed the money, ticket, everything. So he had nothing at all when he started the spiritual journey. Whatever possessions he had, you know, he was deprived of. And then um, the, he collected some money from people around and bought a ticket up to some place near Pondicherry. The rest of the way he had to walk. But here you see a remarkable thing about him. See, had it happened to me or to any ordinary person, what would we think? Oh, I am starting my spiritual journey and this has happened, we would have looked upon it as a bad omen and probably we would come back and not start again for some time. But Yogi Ram Surat Kumar, Ram Surat Kumar, the young man, thought, Oh, I am starting on a spiritual journey and this money, everything has been taken away from me. This is God's will, which means God does not want me to depend upon money. 
money is never a security. See the way the mind set us, the way he thinks, the way we would think, it makes all the difference. He came to Sierra Bindu, spent some time there, and then he heard about Raman Maharishi. He came to Tiruvannamalai, spent about two months there, sat before Raman Maharishi. In both the places, he had, uh, you know, he could go into higher reaches of consciousness, but there was no final fulfillment. So he returned to the Himalayas and then uh, he was just roaming about. He went to Shivananda's ashram and served there for some time under Swami Shivananda. And uh, that is when he heard about the Samadhi of Raman Maharishi and Vishayarabhi. He became very desperate. He also saw, when Raman Maharishi passed away, he saw, um, what do they call it, the comet. Yeah. Uh, the passing across the sky. And then he knew instantly that Raman Maharishi had attained Samadhi. Because, you know, by then he had developed, by his own meditation, he had developed some Siddhis. Even then he was an advanced soul. But then he was waiting for the final fulfillment. Now, when he was in Ramanashram, he had heard about Papa Ramdas of Kanyangad, Kerala. He went there, but he was not very impressed by Papa Ramdas. It's it just that uh, the time had not come for him. So he returned. Now back in the Himalayas, after he heard the news of the Mahasamadhyam, two great spiritual giants, he felt terrible and desperate. The only one that came to his mind was Papa Ramdas. So immediately he rushed to Kanjangar. See, at that time when he went there, he was not interested. But people had said to him that he was a great soul. So that had kind of impressed upon the fabric of his soul. It was staying with him, but he never gave a thought to it because he was all the time bent upon Raman Maharishi and Sri Aurobindo. But now they had, see, it was an eye-opener to him. And suddenly he knew he had to go to Paparandas. Don't, there, there is no why to such thing. Why he was not impressed? Because Papa Ramdas was seated in a, a beautiful chair, he was being served by Mataji Krishna Bhai, and uh, the life seemed very comfortable. He felt that Papa Ramdas was living like a king, not like Sri Aurobindo or Papa. Uh, I'm sorry, Raman Maharishi. Uh, all I can say is he was already an advanced soul. He could not have missed out on the. Uh, the greatness of Papa Ramdas, but I can only say the time had not come. The Maya plays a role in these places. Now, you see, now the time has come. So immediately he rushed to Papa Ramdas, also ignored him at that time. Now, when he rushed all the way to Papa Ramdas' place, Ananda Ashram, Papa Ramdas was waiting for him. Papa Ramdas knew about Yogi Ram Kumar. He knew his future mission also. He was waiting for him to turn up. And this time Papa Ramdas was very, very sweet to him. What was more, he not only welcomed him with such love, he said, um, he, he narrated some of the incidents that took place in Ram Kumar's life, which no one else knew. So that convinced Ram Kumar, the youth, that Papa Ramdas was truly a great person and that his future lay at his feet. So Papa Ramdas also asked him to stay for two months in his ashram. But then what happened? Hardly 15 days. Then Papa Ramdas was initiating a lady into Ramna and there was a crowd standing around watching this. This Ram Surat Kumar, the youth also joined the crowd and suddenly he felt an urge to be initiated into Ramna by Papa Ramdas. So without any hesitation or fear, he went straight to Papa Ramdas and said, please initiate me also. People, he was a very shy person by nature, he wouldn't do anything of this sort. But suddenly he was taken, he was overwhelmed by an emotion, something took over. 
and then he found himself approaching Papa Ramdas and speaking these words. And what was more, Papa Ramdas turned his face away for a second or two, and then he turned back to young Ram Sudhakumar, smiled and said, Okay, you sit down. And immediately spoke this mantra, Om Shri Ram, Jai Ram, Jai Jai Ram, three times, making him repeat, making Ram Sudhakumar repeated. And then Papa gave one instruction, what? You chant this mantra all the twenty-four hours of the day. And the way he was instructing him, it was so powerful an instruction. Bhagwan later said, Papa Ram does not only gave Ram Nam, but also Ram Ban. Because it came like the killer arrow of Rama and triggered something in, inside him. Immediately he walked up to the hill and there was a cave, he sat there and he began to chant this mantra day and night, day and night, with no thought for food or sleep. And Yogiji said much later, years later to me, that he was doing it only six nights and six days. On the seventh day, Papa Ramdas killed him, murdered him, and then it became eternal living for him. In the depth of his ego was born Yogi Ram Sarakamar. It was an exodus, exodus of uh, this world, you know, exodus from this world, from this kingdom, the kingdom of ordinary world to the kingdom of the divine. So he said, this beggar died at the lotus feet of Papa Ramdas. After that, there is no individual in this body. It's only my father, the cosmic father, and he alone it is. There is nothing else, no one else. So this was it. In seventh day, nobody gets this, you know, this uh, final illumination on the seventh day of Japa. It, it can only mean that he was already a very advanced to soul. He just needed the touch of Papa Ramdas and the touch of Ramna, and then he blossomed into a high soul. After the enlightenment, Papa Ramdas said, I have given you everything, there is nothing more to give you. Now you can go from here. But you know, Bhagwan became so attached to Papa Ramdas, he just could not bring himself to leave him. Papa Ramdas had really to push him out. He said, you have to go because you have a mission. And then he asked, Papa Ramdas asked him, where would you go? And the, the divine spontaneity in him said, Thiruvannamalai. After the ego dies, the divine takes over and then the soul begins to live in a divine spontaneity. There is no need to go through the pros and cons of a matter and then make a decision and then execute it for the ordinary people, for those people where the ego is active. But for those people, these divine people, the divine spontaneity takes over. There is no need for brain anymore. So much so Bhagawan would say, oh, this beggar has no brain. This beggar has no mind like you people. You people are all very lucky. He would make fun of us. <laughs> so you see, and, uh, the thing is, the divine spontaneity spoke, Tiruvannamalai. But it took him seven years of wandering all over India, right up to the Himalaya from Kanyakumari, before he landed in Tiruvannamalai. The secret India is the sacred India. In fact, the true name of this land is Bharat. It means Bha. Bha means light. So Bharati, the land that rebels in the light of sacred wisdom. 
That's why it's called Bharat. This is also Jnana Bhumi and it's a playground of great, great masters. The invocation of the Divine is the heartbeat of our beloved nation. Swami Vivekananda used to say, when he was abroad, people put all kinds of questions to him and one of them was very potent. They said, all these Western countries have developed so much in science and technology. We are developed countries, but your country is still developing. Why is it, despite all the spiritual strength, the spiritual backbone of India, why should it struggle like this? And Swami Vivekananda said, I loved India before I came here. Now the very dust of India has become holy to me. The very air of India is holy to me. The India, the holy land is a place of pilgrimage for me. It is a Tita. You see, for Vivekananda, not only for Vivekananda, all the great masters call this Bhumi, this Bharat Bhumi, as Jnana Bhumi. It is the Leela Bhumi of the great masters, the playground of great masters. And uh, by way of answering those people, Swami Vivekananda replied immediately, Oh, your countries have developed in science and technology. But what has India been doing? Oh God, India, what has India been doing for ages and ages except producing sages, he said. And he said it so dramatically, <laughs> there was a standing ovation. And this comment of his was very dear to the heart of Yogi Ram Sarikma. It never failed to draw cascades of laughter from him. Bhagwan Yogi Ram Sarikma, my master, went one step ahead and said, this land is so holy, even to be born in India, you must have done meritorious deeds in your past births. Such is the glory of India. Sri Ravindana Tagore said, India, the glorious destiny of India is to be the teacher of all lands. And Sri Aurobindo, in the words of Sri Aurobindo, India has to be the moral leader of the world. So, Yogi Ram Sarutkumar himself used to say, it is the playground of great masters, the custodians of the divine plan. It will never be taken away from us. Believe me, my friend, truth shall have its way. And then he would dissolve into enigmatic laughter. So such is the glory and that the riches of India, the unique riches of India, have always been the great spiritual masters and teachers of rare eminence from uh, varied uh, lineages, and traditions, you can say. Why it is secret, in spite of the kaleidoscopic chaos, disorder, disharmony, and the poverty, the suffering that you see on the surface of India, it is still going on with this, because of this backbone, the spiritual backbone of India, and it's behind and therefore it's secret. It doesn't come to the fore except through these great masters. Tiruvannamalai, the mountain, is considered as the very embodiment of Lord Shiva. It is the divine beacon of light. Now, when Lord Shiva, the huge mountain, it looks like any other mountain. It's just a stone mountain. It looks so ordinary for any onlooker. but. It's considered very, very special because it is Lord Shiva. The whole Tiruvannamalai turns out to be the Garbhagraha, the Sanctum Sanctorum of Lord Shiva. You know that in any, in any temple, 
the sanctum sanctorum has very special energy yeah. so when this huge mountain serves as lord shiva the whole of tiruvannamalai becomes the sanctum sanctorum with a special energy of shiva and that's why the mountain has this costs a magic spell on all serious seekers of truth it has a charismatic hold it is it's been uh, i should say both a natural and chosen abode of great spiritual giants from time immemorial and most recently you know guhai namashivaya from karnataka guru namashivaya then sheshadri swami and shri raman maharishi and now yogi ram sarath kumar falling into the same line now out of the sheshadri swami raman maharishi and yogi ram sarath kumar they have been in the recent times adding to the glory of tiruvannamalai and uh, you see this one thing very curious sheshadri swami is from a place called kanchipuram where divine mother kamakshi rules and raman maharishi is from a place called madurai it's a the ruler there is the divine mother meenakshi and now yogi ji is from kashi varanasi and there the divine mother is known as visalakshi so the three aspects of the divine mother kamakshi meenakshi visalakshi it is as though their very tapas had taken the forms of these three masters who have been ruling tiruvannamalai with their reign of the blessings the blessing power you know it's a, it's very strange that it happened that way kamakshi then meenakshi and then visalakshi puranic story is that uh, lord vishnu and lord brahma had a competition they wanted to find out the head and the foot of lord shiva so brahma is supposed to have gone up there in search of his head and mahavishnu had gone down and uh, they could not do it they could not find it because shiva appeared as a huge column of fire and this huge column of fire is uh, the ultimate stage what we call the parabrahman it is a state of parabrahman and its immediate expression is fire but it's not a physical fire that we are talking about it is the fire of supreme knowledge and this fire of the column of fire of course it, to the eyes of the people to the physical eyes of the people it stood as the physical fire and this over ages and ages solidified into first the golden and then uh, the precious stone mountain and now it is the stone mount over the ages it had solidified and solidified and solidified into various precious stones and finally in kaliyuga it has come down to the level of stone but the magnetism is there the spiritual power of the mountain is no less now raman maharishi once when he went round the mountain he found a hole an entrance into the mountain and accidentally he went near and peeped inside there to his surprise he found a golden world there were great rishis and they were all completely golden there were streams of water again golden there were birds trees vegetation but everything everything seemed gold the energy of the place the spiritual energy must be of a very high order so much so there is an emission a golden emission a golden radiation so each thing in this world was radiating that high energy and naturally 
it looked very golden. But then the energy was so strong, even Raman Maharishi had to pull out because the physical body would be unable to bear this. People would go to pieces, they will get burnt down. So immediately he hastily withdrew and then he told the temple authorities to put a huge boulder there and close this hole. Because if an ordinary man should find his way in, he would be finished once for all. He wouldn't be able to withstand the force of that energy there. With the result, his body would get burnt. So, Raman Maharishi very hastily withdrew. He himself, he could not bear it because he had a body, human body. And uh, he asked the temple authorities to go close it with a boulder and now nobody knows where the boulder is. It's closed very naturally now, it's become a part of the mountain, there is absolutely no way to go inside. Yet, people who have developed a very high level in meditation, they could uh, sense the subtleties of the atmosphere and it's possible that uh, this appears in the dreams of such people. Apart from Sri Mohanji, there were two or three Mahatmas who had come to our ashram who also said they had seen something like this in their dreams. I was a very ambitious uh, professor. I was already teaching physics in a college. And uh, I loved, I loved teaching, I loved those students because they were all very intelligent and uh, eager to learn. And I liked the college also, I liked my subject, physics, very much. So I had really no complaint about life and I was going to do my PhD and I wanted to do it in one of the foreign universities. So I was trying. At that time, I had landed at his door. <laughs> one of my students had come to him earlier and then she described her experience and she said, she said, ma'am, you must go to him, he's extraordinary, he's not like any of the people we have seen, any of the Mahatmas also, he's absolutely different and he speaks excellent English so you, you'll be able to communicate with him, you must go and see him. Now she is a, a high rank officer in the police department. She is uh, one of the earliest IPS officer and then uh, of course she had now come up very much in life and uh, it is she who reported to me and that made me go and see him, you know. I, but even then I was very casual. I thought I had met many Mahatmas by then. Hadn't they seen Mahatmas and Mahatmas and Mahatmas? My heart has not melted in love. So what's the use? The flood of love. Love should well up inside you. The love for the entire creation, love for the great Mahatmas. And there must be inspiration. And I had met Mahatmas and Mahatmas and taken blessings from them, but nothing special happened to me. They were all great, great people. They were great Mahatmas in their own right. But my moment had not come and so I was unable to enjoy those blessings. And so I was thinking, okay, I have seen Mahatmas and Mahatmas, one more Mahatma, so what, we'll go. So that's how I came to him. I was there at about 5.30 in the evening and there was already a crowd and uh, we were all waiting for the inner door to open. There's a wooden door in the house where he was living and a small veranda and then there's a grill gate and a few steps. So we were all there outside the steps and suddenly the door opened, the inner wooden door opened and then a figure appeared. I tell you, I could not see him fully. I could not see the details of the figure but the impact was so much, so grand so high that I started to tremble. 
and tears were streaming down. I had no idea I was crying, I had no idea I was trembling, I was not even aware of anything except the presence, the huge presence that was walking towards. I could only describe it this way because I didn't really see how he looked at all. The presence came and it opened the door and then was, he was dismissing each person saying, Ram, Ram, my father blesses you, you can go, you can go. You know, giving some people a pat on the back and then blessing them, saying, my father blesses you, or some people Ram, Ram. And soon everybody had left except the three of us. I had gone there with two friends of mine. Okay. Only the three of us were left and then the friend who had come with me, she said, she just uh, nudged me and she said, look, this is our turn, he's going to pack us off. Even as she murmured, you know, she mumbled it to my ears, I was completely unaware of all that was around him. I was just gaping at him with tears streaming down and of course he would know what I was going through. So, we, when we were getting ready to go, he opened the grill gate and he said, come in. He just called us, come in. And he went into the veranda and so we followed him. And you see, when we were going to meet him, I bought four apples. And uh, those two friends of mine, they had not bought anything. They refused to buy because we had been searching for him the past two days, the previous two days, we had been searching and that was the Leela, hide and seek. If we went to his house, we found it locked. And people would say, it just left for the temple. And then we would rush to the temple only to be told by people there, he had just left the temple. And then yeah. evening we would go and again the story would repeat itself. And the next day morning again the same story. Next day evening also the same story. Every time we would reach a place only to be told he had just left. So he was playing this hide and seek. For me, it was sharpening my eagerness to see him. Because I took it very casually in the beginning, but now it was sharpening and there was even a longing to see him. Probably that's why he played the Leela. So we were not sure as we came this time that the door would be open, but the door was open. He had come and my whole being was reacting to his presence. And what was more, he called us in. And you see, I was trembling so much, I dropped all those apples. And the apples were all rolling in all directions. And then he shouted, pick them up. So with trembling hands, very clumsily, I picked all those four. And then he opened the wooden door, walked inside, saying, come in. So he took us right inside the house. And there were already three people seated there. And then there was another place he pointed out, and we sat there. And then, you know, the inside of the house was something like a dumping ground. Things were all scattered around. There was a heap of cigarette boxes, a heap of match boxes, and there was a heap of even currency notes. You know, one rupee, two rupee, ten rupee, hundred rupee coins and uh, currencies, but just heaped up like that. And then there were bottles and bottles of different sizes, different shapes. And then there were many, many odd items and books and newspapers and whatnot. I was thinking, my God, I was shocked. I had never seen a place like that in my life, especially a place of a Mahatma. Anyway, I was already drawn inside because of his presence. And so I didn't spend much time looking around. I went and sat in my play and there was a chair it looked very wobbly, very old chair. And I, the passing thought was, how could anybody sit in this? He went and took that same chair, brought it and put it before me and sat there like an emperor. It was a bamboo chair, very old one, broken in certain places. And I was just wondering who could sit in that. He just, uh, you know, sat there before me. And I tell you, that was the first time I had a good look at him. He was wearing very colorful two or three shawls and a very carelessly tied turban overhead. And his eyes were shining. And uh, my God, he was extraordinary. And when I sat there, 
He asked for our names and then he looked straight into my eyes. I was gaping at him, you know. And he looked at my eyes and said, what is, what do you, what do you want from this beggar? What do you want? You see, I had no idea I was going to uh, go to one of the foreign universities to start to do my PhD. I had ambitions like any other teacher. But here, I was saying when he asked, I want to see God. And I had no idea I had uttered it also. And then he said, what? You want to see God? Oh God, he said. And then he put his hand over his head and said, Oh God, and he went into peals of laughter. Upro you know how it is. Uproarious laughter, cascading laughter. And then he called one of those three people there, Oh Ganesha, do you know what she wants? She wants to see God. Oh God. And then he would slap his thigh heavily, put his hand on his head and say, Oh God. This went on, this Leela went on for quite some time and then finally, you know, because I was already crying and the way he went into laughter and sharing the fun with other people, I felt terrible and I thought maybe I had no qualification even to mention such a thing. And I felt so terrible, I wanted the earth to open and swallow me. I did not want to live one single minute more. <laughs> so you can remember. So here I was and I was sobbing now, openly crying and then, you know, his face softened, just looking at it. And then he said, Devki, this beggar has not seen God. How can he help you? This beggar has not seen God. Oh, when you want to see God, and then he said, Oh, Devki is a good soul. She will see God. This beggar has not seen God, but Devki will see God. She is a pure soul. So he started this Leela and immediately the lady, you know, the teacher who had come with me, she said, I don't know what inspired her to say that. She said, Swami, we do not know whether we are pure or impure, but now that the word has come out of your mouth, she has become pure from this moment. What a beautiful answer. To it would never have struck me, you know, to say that. But she was inspired to say that. As soon as Swami heard it, his whole expression changed. He became radiant, he became very serious, and then he looked at me very sharply, penetratingly, raised his hand in benediction and started to bless. All the three of us felt some passing current of electricity passing through our body. And then I had no idea what happened to me. All thoughts drained. And there was a beautiful, deep, deep, deep peace filling my entire being. I had no idea how long, how many minutes passed. I only knew this peace and bliss. And I saw him, I remember one particular thought that went through that and that was, if there is a God, here is he sitting before me. That was the only thought that came to me, all other thoughts drained. You see, for four years I had gone up to the Himalayas every year searching for a Guru. But when it came to Yogi Ransarath Kumar, I came very casually with different ambitions, but I was caught. And then everything changed. Whatever exists is one life, unity. Nothing is separate, nothing isolated. This beggar is related to the sun, to the moon, to the infinite cosmos. This beggar is not limited to this body. Do you hear, Devaki? The more you are going on serving this beggar, the
the more you'll be aware of the unity of life. So yes, I was telling that if Devaki looks after this beggar, it means she loves all. When this, this beggar is being looked after Devaki, it, it means it, looking after all. When you are watering the root of the tree, the whole tree is being nurtured. That's all the way I can say nothing else. Namaste. Supreme Father, who is everywhere, I am His Son, the Supreme Father's Son. Shri Rama Jaya Rama Jaya Jaya Rama Shri Rama Jaya Rama Jaya Jaya Jai Jai Ram,